hey there. So this is the, the first of a series of videos that I'd like to produce with my friend Yasha here. And it's an actual interesting project that uh, we're, we're doing. We're chronicling the, uh, the journey that Yasha is on. And I suppose the journey is sort of the, the ending of his adventure, of his life. Um, Yasha's got Parkinson's disease, which kind of speeds up uh, some of the challenges we all get as we age. And what I'm interested in is learning about challenges that Yasha is facing so that we can learn uh, because we all face uh, this at some point uh, in, or indeed sort of an ongoing part of being human. Now Yasha you've had a very exciting wonderful life and you're you're still having a very interesting and varied life but I want to start at the end. So I'd like you to imagine this is an opportunity for you to talk from beyond this life. If, if you had a message uh, or some things to say to, to people who are going to still be here when you have uh, moved on or to say about life, what was the experience like? What what, uh, what would you do differently? What advice would you give? What did you like the best? This is the time I'd like to hear them. So Yasha, uh, not to put you on, on the spot, what would your message be? From... It's a wonderful question, Martin, thank you. Uh, I'll tell you what, uh, I, feel, I feel, I've used that term of saying being a, candidate at the door of the initiation into spirituality. That's where I feel I am. And I feel that I can see through that door already something that was beyond. And now, now, supposing, presuming that I'm gone, the first thing I would like to do is to communicate back again a new language of all the things that we have not yet given names to which we knew have been there, but we have been unable to express, to facilitate, in other words, those who are following me into understanding, into an understanding of where I am now, now that I'm gone. So that I think would be my first function. Buddhism has been teaching me for a long time to try and do good. And in fact, to remain, a, not to become a Buddha in order to be able to assist others. I can't think of a more practical way of doing that then inventing a new language in my new world, which I can communicate onto earthly beings for them to understand more of what's going on beyond. And maybe that language, Yasha, maybe that wouldn't be like words. Maybe, maybe if we were to, we who knew you and loved you, if we were to think about you, to tune in, maybe we'd be able to sense some of the things that you're sort of shining to us from this new state, maybe maybe a mess. Maybe it'd be a language of the heart more than of the head. What, what are your thoughts? Anything is possible. I'm. I'm <laughs> there is oh. so much more that there is. We know so little, and there is so much more to be known. We know there is what we don't know. I mean, uh, the Kabbalah tells us we'd go blind if we could even have a minor, minimum sight of what's beyond. Yes. We are just, I kept on repeating in my lifetime all the time that we are prisoners of our own words and the limitations of our own vocabulary and of our own understanding. We experience it, something, we experience something, we give it a name and then we limit that experience to the name we've given it. Yes, and so it, it becomes limiting it, rather it, than it a label, yes. Limited. And yet we know that there is huge amount of stuff beyond it. But there's something I, interesting... I cannot, Sorry, I, I can see if that the stuff beyond you are saying is not necessarily something that we can put into words, but it's merely feelings we can have on emotions. Uh, I agree, two, but we, yeah. we can still give it a name. We can still call it something. Yes, um, now there are two things you've said that are really interesting to me. First is that as you 
as you move along in your journey at the moment, you find yourself getting a, it's almost like you're starting to get a glimpse. It, it kind of felt like your spirituality awareness is growing. Uh, is, is, if I interpret that correctly? Absolutely, absolutely. I, I feel very strongly, you mentioned Parkinson's at the beginning of this introduction. I feel Parkinson's is, has joined me and is a de degenerating as my life goes along. And I feel my spirituality has come not at the same time, but just a little bit earlier, but probably fairly similar time. And it's increasing all the time. And this decreasing of my Parkinson, deterioration of my Parkinson, and improvement and increasing of my spiritual awareness are going to meet. This is and really the meeting point. Yes. The feel I get from you, and I don't want to put words into your mouth, the feel I get is you imagine um, all the things that people do um, in different traditions to try to get more in tune, their sort of fasting or their abstinence or their, they try, and, and there's almost a sense there that maybe if the human body is a little bit weakened or their mind is a little bit uh, detached from that body, that would allow them to get a clear vision of the underlying forces and the true nature. It's almost your description is almost like this, the uh, condition you've got, but also the, the circumstances that it brings to mind. It's almost like this is bringing around this for you. Uh, it's quite a very interesting thing. It's it's like a as your your body uh, goes through these hardships, you realise how much you are not that body. Would that be a good description? Yes, yes. I mean, I think um, the more I've become aware of spirituality as a whole, the more I've realised that there is a difference between what you understand and believe and what you actually practice in your belief. Understanding is easy. Everyone can understand what we are trying to teach, what any of the traditions are teaching, any of the religions are teaching. But practicing it with conviction is a different question. And now, you, I keep on, you keep on having to doubt yourself as to whether am I really genuinely believing what I'm saying I'm believing and what I feel. Now, I've said for a while that I honestly believe that my body is separate from my spirituality. And that in practical terms, I've been applying this. Every morning I get up and I talk to myself. Get up, Parky, because I refer to my body as Parky. My theory is that Parky has got Parkinson's in my body. I am a separate entity that is doing very well, thank you very much. I don't need Parky except for the fact that it's attached to me. So, Parky rules some of the conditions of my existence, and I have to treat it well because I, I, I rely on it to be able to survive alive. But I will not allow Parky to rule my day-to-day -day activities. So, as long as I can keep that up, one of us is going to be sort of in that balance between these two entities, Parkinson's in my body, myself in my spiritual entity. My spiritual entity continues. My spiritual entity was there before I came and will be there after I've gone. Park is, of course, going to pass away and die, and it'll be very interesting to see what happens then. Now, this, what is really exciting about this viewpoint? Um, I can't hear you. Your voice is gone. Okay. So what, what's really interesting about what you just said, and I think really useful, is that many people watching this right now will have things that they need to deal with about having a body. And sometimes we can feel a bit bad about that. They feel like they should be completely healthy or they, they're, they're, it's, it's something that is part of them. And your position, which is almost one of being a custodian of this body, that's what it sort of feels like, that you are a custodian and you're caring for it and looking after it, but you are not it. That position of detachment, I think, could help a lot of people cope with the day to day. Uh, that this is, while we are incarnated, there is no perfection um, in the body, uh, but it doesn't mean yes. that we need to be pulled 
fully down by this. Uh, this is this is very interesting. I must tell you, I read uh, or heard, I think, a rabbi giving an analogy, which I thought very useful because it's very practical. He says our body is like a computer. We plug it in into the electricity and it comes alive. We unplug it and it's dead, it does nothing at all. So the body is the computer. The plug we plug in is our soul, our, our, our spirituality. The electricity that gives it energy to the body is spirituality. When there is spirituality, the body is alive. When there's no spirituality, the body dies. Now, the body will always die at some stage. Electricity, which actually re revives the body, doesn't necessarily have to die. No. In fact, it's always there. Whether it's switched on or switched off, it doesn't affect it. The energy is a spirituality and the computer itself is the body. It's nice, nice energy. I like it. it. I've also seen people do pictures that the pattern of our nerves is like a lightning strike. Yes. It, so it's sort of showing the, uh, a, a energy diffusion pattern, you know, so we're sort of, we're a bolt of energy and this is sort of manifest. Now there's something else. Images, sorry. sorry, I'm just going to say that those images I found always very useful. But what is interesting I find is that you find them everywhere. The Kabbalah has got its tree of life, the wheel of life for the Buddhists, and uh, the tracing board for the Freemason. Yeah. Everybody has got his own image, which, he, which is useful to, to identify his own beliefs. Yes, yeah, so, so for anyone who doesn't know about Freemasonry, uh, tracing boards are like Masonic mandalas, almost. They're sort of uh, pictures to meditate. Masonic trees of life. Yes, I could see, yes. There is something else you said that I thought, oh, um, you're talking about in the Kabbalah, they say that we couldn't even glimpse these higher levels. They would be blinding to us. It made me think of how, um, in that sense, our ignorance could almost be protecting us. You know, we're not ready to see it. So we deliberately don't understand until we're ready. We deliberately keep ourselves limited uh, just, to, just to protect our vision. Uh, this is something uh, Giordano Bruno puts in his wheels. He has a, a so well, it's, it's a practical thing for the Kabbalah as well. The Kabbalah says that you're not supposed to study Kabbalah until you're at least 40 years old and until at least you've learned the whole of the Torah, or the, or the, or the Tanakh and the Old Testament. Get so, the basics down, yes. Yes. Um, absolutely. So this, this growing spirituality, this growing awareness, what are you starting to sense about things? Or is it not quite, you know, as clear as that yet? Is it, can you put it into words? What is changing? What are you starting to find out? What is clear is what I want to be able to sense. So I want to be able to sense the difference that exists between my physicality as a body material world and to and my spirituality parallel to it and connected by this energy that is present so i see genuinely two different levels a material earthly level and a spiritual eternal level mm -hmm. now now the practical way of trying to apply that to my life because it's the theory is quite clear cut i can understand it now I want to see to what an extent I can actually apply it in the sense of everything that happens to me, every word, every, my grandchildren that give me the joy and pleasure of what, you know, of their, of their company. Can I apply it to a material world only or can I also apply it to a spiritual world? So I'm dividing as to where everything that happens to me now in the last, I mean, I'm 80 years old, so there's a limited amount of time in my view that's left must fit into one of those brackets. Material, if it is purely earthly, if it is purely within the pleasure and the suffering that we have between birth and death, or spiritual at a level that will continue way past after my body is gone. So what I'm trying to achieve is to persuade myself of what I've just said to you, that that is exactly what's happening. The, again, the feel is almost like there's an inkling 
a growing inkling that in it, part of you is thinking, oh, is this, I, I feel drawn towards knowing this, but am I starting to know this? It feels like there's a, a it's like a, a hint is growing of how things are. It's, that's the feel I kind of get from outside. It's really interesting to hear. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, clearly there is much more, and as I, I already just repeated, uh, we're limited by how we can express ourselves. Mm. But you look out of the window at night into the sky and there is... <laughs> can you explain what you're, you're dealing with? So, we all deal with some limitations, but it, what is it like living um, with, well, there's, there's big changes happening with Parkinson, but also age must make change what you can do and how things work, you know, what, what what, what is it, uh, you must not be able to express everything you used to do in the world or must have to find different ways of doing things. Tell me what it's like being in that vessel. You're talking about the body is, you know, if we if we swapped, what would I be dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis? What would be different? I'm having a good life. And I feel very contented and lucky. Uh, I feel fortunate that I've got Parkinson's. I keep on saying I was planning on living my life. I thought 85 years old would be about the limit. Since I got Parkinson's, the neurologists have given me 20 more years. So I, I seem to have got more, to, <laughs> more time with Parkinson's than I had before. But having Parkinson's, having any disease, I would have thought, but Parkinson's specifically, has concentrated all my medical concerns, all my physical concerns onto one subject and thing. It has almost cleared the way for me to have more time for spirituality. Whereas I could have had other illnesses that could have been a much worse nuisance because now if I get a knee ache, I don't worry about it. I blame it on Parkinson's. Everything is Parkinson's. So that, you've that, got a scapegoat for every problem. A scapegoat for everything. <laughs> but that's a nice way of waking up in the morning knowing that my neck is aching, my leg is aching. Well, all that is Parkinson's, I'll carry on with the rest of the stuff that I've got to do. So I have a path that is open to me. And what I'm... I honestly believe there is life after death. So I believe that. I believe there is something beyond death. That, uh, the thing is to discover what. Or at least to get a hint of what it might be. Mm. I must tell you one thing very interesting, if I may deviate just one second. Certainly. We'll probably talk more about death, but one of the things that I've done is I've managed to stop fearing death. As a child, as a youngster, as a, through my adulthood, I was always afraid of death. And in more recent times, especially as the influence of Michael Bajan, I believe I stopped fearing death. I get the sense in this interview with you now that you're doing me one huge favor. You're making me look forward to death. I'm beginning to, you're arousing my curiosity sufficiently for me to say, come on then, let's get there. And maybe you and I can communicate afterwards. Yes, that would be wonderful. Uh, I do, do do certainly come back. Um, but I want you to promise uh, when we communicate to give more detail than most uh, sort of uh, seances have. Well, you better get ready with some questions. I certainly, certainly shall. <laughs> um, I, one thing I just want to make a, a mental note for us. I think one of our future videos should be the advantages of Parkinson's. I love this. <laughs> this is like using it to your advantage, using everything in life to your I advantage. I think we, we might need more than one session for that one. There are yeah. huge advantages. Because you've, you've got it, so you need to turn it to your advantage the best you can. That's all you can do. That's sort of, uh, that's alchemy. And it sounds like that's, that's kind of what you're doing. No, there are, there are genuinely, genuinely lots of advantages to Parkinson. Not least the sympathy with which you are treated by everybody. That's wonderful. So it does show the kindness of yeah, the Yeah, you know, the compassion that you get. Yes, this is something I've experienced. When I, I my, my 
mothers in a wheelchair. And people are so kind. Uh, don't get me wrong, sometimes there are disadvantages being in a wheelchair. Um, when I, I go sort of out to take my mum for lunch, they look at me and say, well, what does she want? Yeah. <laughs> and mum thinks, well, I don't know, what, well, how, well, I'm still here, I'm still... <laughs> I, well, I can it's also true, sometimes people like you in spite of you not being ill. <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah, so there, there we are. There's a, there's a, a, a sign there of, of, of something. Um, so with, you've been talking about the, this, this path to the next place and you sound very much, it's like almost like Socrates or one of these great philosophers who start to look forward to that journey. They've, they've found that their mind is separate. They've even journeyed in their, uh, their sort of, uh, they've gone beyond the body. They know where they're going. They're very they're positive about that release. But I'd also like to know a little bit about the value of here. So what is it if we if we look back at your life and I said to you and I said to you, what was really valuable? What did you really like? You, you talk about your grandchildren, the joy of that, and how that can almost make you look up to a higher joy. You know, you can see an as above so below. But what what is important in life if we look back? Um, are there any uh, things that stand uh, out? Everything. But I want to make a general comment one second first, yes. before I forget it also, it's a sort of mental notes. What, what we are talking about, uh, looking back on my life or the spiritual aspects or feelings and all this, these are thoughts that come into the mind, feelings that come into the mind, into the heart, within our limited experiences. But how often do we actually express them? I find that this conversation with you now, this tape we are doing, which is, is an experiment to some extent, is very interesting because I've never faced myself talking and thinking about these things aloud. I mean, I don't sit in the mornings. I talk to Parky when I wake up in the morning and get him to get up. But I don't face a mirror and try and say, this is my philosophy of life, what do I think, and so on. So to some extent, to some extent, what we are experimenting is new to me as well. I'm developing my own thoughts as we talk about them. Yes, and words being the, the thoughts made manifest. So I think, Absolutely. and that, that's very interesting. That's very interesting. And, so I think, I, I tell you what I'd like to explore next session, right? So we've done half an hour today. What I'd like to do is plant a seed for our next conversation. Yeah, you, you didn't let me answer the question you did ask oh, me. Oh, go on, I'll ask you. I'll keep it very brief. But you were asking of, the, of, my, of my lifetime. Mm. I see my lifetime genuinely as milestones. First of all, reaching the age of 80, thank God, as healthy as I am and well, and uh, mentus compass, which is the most important aspect from my point of view, is a blessing already. So I feel everything I look, everything I look behind me before the ages of 80, before the age of 80, is bonuses that I've had in my lifetime that have brought me here. Uh, doesn't matter whether God gave me the strength to achieve something physically successful uh, or uh, able to join the army or whatever else it is, which are natural sort of given, or, or academic achievements or my involvement in Freemasonry and other sort of other studies. Each one is a block of my lifetime that I can separate from the rest of my lifetime. So when I look back behind me, I see scales of things that I've done or things that I've, I, I almost use the word achieved, but not everything that I've done was an achievement necessarily. The fact that I finished and started something else, I suppose in itself must be an achievement. Oh, absolutely. But, uh, I interrupted you there. 
No, no, I, I look forward to hearing some of these uh, stories in, in subsequent videos. And that's why I'm, I'm planting a seed. So our next discussion, our uh, uh, next conversation, I would like to be themed around your experiences and relationship with uh, mortality, with death. So as I sit here before you, Yasha, I remember when I first found out I was going to die. I actually remember it as a child. How old were you? I must have been five or six. And I, I just couldn't believe it. It seemed very unrealistic to me. It seemed very unfair that you'd, I mean, so you're born and you grow all the way up and then it just ends at the end. And I remember talking to my father saying, crying about it. And he, how do you reassure someone? He's saying it's not going to be for a very long time, Martin. And I thought, I don't care. I just don't want that to happen. You may have a similar one. I don't want you to talk about it now, but through your life, through the adventure of being Yasha, there must have been times where this theme has come to, uh, to remind you. Uh, it could have been in the military. It could have been when you were competing in judo. It could have been in something in your Freemasonry. It could be in your Buddhism now. It could be someone close to you. It may, maybe it was just you walking down the street and you had a close shave with a truck. But there's times where this has come up and said, this is going to happen, Yasha. And your way of dealing with it and choosing how, how, you, how you dealt with the states of human mortality must have changed uh, as you went on. There may be different circumstances when that happened. And I'd like to hear that. Because well, in this interview already, we've already got some very useful things, how, how to how to deal with uh, uh, the state, be, accepting the um, limitations of your body, uh, understanding that we kind of hold ourselves back from that, pure, that vision we're not ready for. These things are very useful. Knowing how you have dealt with this trial and this, this state, and knowing how, you, what, how you're learning to now, now that your, your spirituality has been pushed on fast forward for you, would be uh, a really beneficial. Um, would you be happy to contemplate this? Sounds fascinating, if I may say so myself. Wonderful. Okay, then, so we will uh, book in for our next conversation, which will have a, a memento mori uh, uh, theme. There is a PS to all this one second, Martin. Certainly, I want to hear. The PS is basically that I would like to keep track. I don't know when our next tape is going to be. But I would like to keep track of both my deteriorating uh, diagnosis for Parkinson as and the increasing quality of my spirituality. Yes. So it's a matter of keeping track of those. Because so make... I'm worried about I'm worried about Parkinson's. I, I'm my mind. I'm worried mostly at how it's affecting my mind because well, it's what... definitely yeah. slowing me down. Well, that's what we'll do. Every single video, I'll check in on how you are, how it's changed, how you're dealing with how it's changed, and uh, this will allow us uh, to to see your progress, but also what you've learned, how your spirituality, how your awareness is evolving. It's been very exciting to see if, how these, if these inklings become more clear. And uh, this is for many people watching, you are the scout in the landscape that we're all to walk over. And the guinea pig. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't going to quite use the guinea pig term, but yes, you are the guinea pig. But the scouts, unlike the guinea pig, can, can actually call back and say, here's the terrain. So people watching this, maybe, you know, 14, maybe 14. Let me tell you what, I'm watching. Yeah. <laughs> I'm curious to see how it goes. Wonderful.